Hi everyone, I'm Daniela from the Global Economic Dynamics team and you're listening to our very first Get Read. So before we dive into the main topic of today, let me tell you a little bit about our new series. With Get Reads, we want to provide you with short summaries and excerpts of some of the most relevant publications, books and articles that we think are shaping the economic and social debate over time. In addition to this, you will also find audios like this one or videos where we talk and interview the authors and experts on the topics we have selected. For our first Get Read, we had the opportunity to talk to Professor Darren Asimoglu. Although he has focused most of his academic life on the study of institutions and democracy, he's also interested in the role automation plays in our economies, not only changing the labor market, but also creating new political and institutional challenges. So with that in mind, enjoy our first Get Read. So the first question I have is, in many of your studies, you emphasize the major economic political changes in history have been the result of the interaction between existing institutions and critical junctures. Mm -hmm. Like it was at some point the Industrial Revolution and currently mm -hmm. the digitalization of our economies. So in that regard, what are the major challenges you see in the current path of Western institutions in regard to automation and digitalization? Are these institutions prepared for to face these challenges? Or is there anything you consider that should be changed? So thank you for the question. That's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, I think the answer is definitely no. The institutions are not ready. and, uh, and But it's not unusual in some sense, if you look at it from the viewpoint of history, that for many of the similar disruptive technological waves in the past, the existing institutions have always been maladapted to the uh, to the to the needs of these new technologies, and sometimes they have been transformed in the process. Sometimes they stood on the in the way and uh, prevented the productive deployment of these technologies. And in some sense, uh, the situation is not very different today. So you've mentioned the Industrial Revolution, completely uh, similar in that sense that, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, most of Europe to start with was still very much uh, in a political system where political power was in the hands of landowners, the organization of the workforce was uh, very inefficient. The workforce did not have the necessary skills. The market wasn't large enough for many of the uh, industrial technologies to achieve the most efficient scale. And uh, in Britain, many uh, of these problems were gradually and gradually solved. Uh, as a result of a political process. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can, for example, separate uh, the, uh, <coughs> uh, the democratization process mm -hmm. in the UK uh, that started really in earnest at the beginning of the 19th century with the first reform act from how the country adapted and responded to the disruptions created by the Industrial Revolution, but then ultimately also enabled it to start making better use of these industrial technologies. Uh, you cannot think of the industrial technologies reaching fruition in the UK and in other parts, uh, you know, without the uh, uh, bureaucratic reorganization, taxation, education investments, uh, other infrastructure investments such as canals and roads and railways. And all of these things did not come in automatically. Many of them were protracted. Many of them happened inefficiently, slowly. Uh, for instance, you know, the uh, uh, in the UK, uh, a lot of the road infrastructure was done by the private sector, whereas it could have probably been done more efficiently by the public sector, which wasn't existent at the time. But more strikingly, you know, if you look at other countries, they have failed at uh, even doing the, 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 the <coughs> what, 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 what Britain did. So the same industrialized, uh, in, uh, the same industrialization technology, when it became available, 
to other countries, many in Eastern Europe, for example, they did not adapt to it. They, in fact, sometimes strenuously resisted it, blocked it. So this is just a parable for saying that there is no need to, there's no uh, presumption, there should be no presumption that uh, institutions are somehow going to adapt to the needs and uh, and uh, uh, and the structure that's necessitated by new technologies. Now, why does that matter? It matters greatly because, first of all, you can block them, as yeah. I just mentioned. But even when you don't block them, unless the sort of supporting technological, uh, organizational, human capital and institutional changes are made, those technologies are not going to be very efficiently deployed. So, for instance, uh, it's pretty clear that you know, a, an industrial workforce needs more skills, especially for certain aspects of the production process than an agricultural workforce. But that those skills were very slow in coming and in places where they weren't really invested, you know, such as Southern Europe, for example, industrialization was not very productive and a lot of its promise was sort of wasted. So looked at it from that point of view, today you can say we are again in the midst of a new wave of technologies. What makes them similar to the Industrial Revolution of the 18th century is that in some sense there is a broad range of technologies that are going to affect many different parts of the production process. Mm -hmm. So Industrial Revolution, it's not just textiles. It started in textiles, but it spread to every sector of the economy. Mm -hmm. And the same thing with the automation, robots, uh, artificial intelligence. You know, it's not just cars, but every sector of the economy ultimately is going to be affected by it. And just like the Industrial Revolution episode that I mentioned, I think it is safe to say that they are going to be quite destructive also. So a lot of my research so far on automation really uh, emphasizes that there is or used to be a presumption among economists uh, that technological change that increases productivity ultimately and pretty automatically improves the demand for labor. It translates into wage growth, employment growth. And that's always been patently false. I don't think there is any episode in which that happens in a seamless manner as in our models. But in the context of automation technologies, I think it's even more wrong. Uh, okay. So, and, and existing evidence, I think, is quite clear that automation, of course, by its nature, in some sense, so it's theoretically very clear, by its nature, it replaces labor by capital in tasks that were previously performed mm -hmm. by labor. As such, reduces the labor share and as such creates downward pressure on labor demand. It may or may not fully translate into lower wages, but it certainly does not have the same capacity to increase wages as, uh, say, uh, technological changes that directly increase yeah. the productivity of labor. So as such, it's a very disruptive technology. And, uh, and, and why does it need to be combined with a whole host of other organizational changes? Well, that I think is very interesting and it has a lot in common with industrial revolution in that sense. And I would say there are at least four reasons why uh, to make better economic and social use of automation, we need to have a uh, significant reorganization of society. Mm -hmm. One is technical. Uh, you know, the structure of organizations, firms, needs to change for, uh, and that's the easiest one, but they need mm -hmm. to change in order for automation to happen productively. 
it's pretty uh, straightforward. You can see that in, in many sectors, but take, for example, uh, use of robots in, uh, in, in, in warehousing. Mm -hmm. So humans can work in any geometry. They can work in very complex, very uh, semi-ordered environments. Robots cannot. So you have to reorganize your warehouses so that robots can move. They're, they have the data about where the different things are so that that data is much better, much more efficient for them than just using sensors for everything. So that just requires a restructuring of the workplace, but it also requires a restructuring of the environment. You don't need supervisors for, for, for workers, work. you need supervisors. For robots, you need you know, integrators or uh, people who will maintain them. So, 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 so this, that's, that's pretty trivial. Uh, but, but it's important, mm -hmm. and, and in many places that's very slow, so you don't get enough productivity gains. The second, I think, is much more important, that you need to think about how is it that we can make best use of robots for improving living standards, for automation. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is that it's not sufficient for an economy to just keep on introducing automation technologies. It needs to be, those technologies need to be combined with other technologies that improve the productivity of labor in other tasks or new tasks. So, and we can approach this from two different angles, and I think though both of them are important and interesting. Uh, so the first one is, you know, automation is not new. No. It's been going on for, you know, 250 years. You know, the uh, industrial uh, techn uh, revolution technologies had one other thing in common with the current wave is that many of the early stage technological changes were very much targeted at replacing labor just as in with the automation technology. They were forms of automation technologies. For example, the uh, <coughs> water frame or other machines that yes. uh, improved, uh, uh, that sort of got the skilled artisan out of the picture and, and, and automated their, their tasks. But how come with the presence of these sort of technological changes, uh, labor productivity and uh, so I mean, labor demand and wages and employment kept growing. Well, the answer is that there were many, many other tasks that could not be automated. And gradually, firms improved productivity in those tasks. And even more importantly, they started adding more new labor-intensive tasks. Okay. So if you look at the factory floor in... Uh, in some of the primitive factories of the early 19th, late 18th centuries, they look nothing like, you know, the factories of today. Yeah. They, they, they just had manual workers and they weren't really efficiently organized. So all of the addition of the non-production workers, restructuring production, adding design, adding much better understanding of what the market wants, adding... Uh, engineers so that work can be more efficiently mm -hmm. organized and in the process adding new products and people who produced those new, new products was part of this adding new tasks and then as new tasks were added labor got reinstated into the production process labor demand wages and employment increased so that's a type of restructuring also that really needs to accompany a uh, yeah. production change in technological change like in automation and that's yeah. not automatic also and it does require uh, a set of institutional organizational okay. changes so yeah I have a question regarding that as well um, in your paper you talk about the displacement displacement effect mm -hmm. and how new tasks can counteract it mm -hmm. but do you think that the rise of new tasks is the result of a natural creation process or do you see also a role for instance by the government to accelerate the adapt adaptation of right. labor market? Right, great question. Uh, no, it's not an automatic process. Okay. 
and and in fact uh, that sort of comes to the other two major reorganizations that we will need and I think it's but but I think I like the way you pose the question whether it's an automatic process so I would say that the following that the market will create incentives for new tasks to be introduced why well because there are always entrepreneurs around mm -hmm. trying to do new things and they will stumble upon these new tasks but also as automation proceeds you know that will increase the demand for other complementary things and there will be more workers around because they're losing their jobs so all of these things will create some incentives for the new cast to be created but not sufficient okay so and i think that's one of the important things that we sometimes get confused in 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 uh in, in these types of discussions in general the fact that there will be market incentives for doing countervailing actions in general and, and in the space of technology in particular doesn't mean that that's the right level of activity. So therefore I don't believe that we are going to tend to a, uh, to a society in which labor is completely eliminated. The market will, the, the market doesn't generate incentives for market labor to be completely mm -hmm. eliminated. But the market doesn't generate incentives for the right level of reinstatement of labor either. Mm -hmm. And there are two specific sets of reasons for that, and those are the two next uh, dimensions of institutional adaptation mm -hmm. that I wanted to mention. So the first one was the reorganization of the workplace and firms. The second one was sort of uh, general importance of changing the production process with the new tasks. The third one is skills. Okay. So one barrier to the introduction of new tasks is that new tasks generally require new skills. Yeah, sure. And if those new skills are not there, that will either make it impossible or less, much less productive to actually rapidly or at all introduce these new tasks. Again, let me give you an historical example and I'll mm -hmm. bring it to the current. You know, another episode of rapid automation was the mechanization of agriculture. Yeah. And there uh, we see this process of automation, labor gets shed out of agriculture, agriculture becomes much less labor intensive, workers leave agricultural areas, that's very clear. But, you know, 20, 30 years later, employment is higher, wages are higher. How is that happening? It's happening because in the process, both manufacturing and the services sectors expanded and by adding completely new tasks that did not exist. For example, uh, a whole host of clerical non-production workers in the production in, in manufacturing that didn't exist another huge transformation of the factory floor, many, many new products in new industries, uh, a, a huge rise in clerical workers in retail services, uh, accounting type things. And ah, if you think about these workers, they were all much more educated than the agricultural workers. So how is that possible? Well, it's possible because, and I don't think there was any planning here, it just happened that you know, the West was lucky. Uh, during the previous few decades, there was a much greater increase in educational attainment of the workforce. So the young workers were in a much better position to fill these new roles. So now imagine that we go back, dial back time and go to the same episode, but there is no educational change so that the level of the education stays same level as it was in, say, 1860, 1870. Then you have these clerical positions, but workers who had just the skills of, you know, maybe 
working in agriculture requires skills, but a very different set of skills, not numeracy skills, not reading, writing, not teamwork in an office. Yeah. So all of these things are you learn in high school. So all of those skills are missing. So you're not going to make the same adaptation. You're going to have much less employment, much less productivity growth. So we may be in exactly the same situation today. If you look at curriculum, uh, curricula in you know, the U.S., but also in Europe, they're very backward looking. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's a good path for people such as ourselves that, you know, we can go to college and uh, study graduate. You know, high school prepares us for that. In fact, high school is like a college preparatory course for most people. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at how the general education system serves workers who are not going to, you know, uh, go to advanced degrees, it's not very good. So, you know, the Germ German system perhaps is a little bit better because of the vocational uh, sort of training track. Yeah. But in most, most, uh, in most countries, it's, uh, it's quite deficient relative to that. There isn't any sort of forward-looking element. What are the skills that are going to be necessary? And if you look at a country like the U.S., employers are, and I think the same is true in Europe, employers are continuously complaining about not being able to find workers with the right skill, yeah. while at the same time, they're not actually hiring. So that's a very telltale sign that actually there is a mismatch between the available skills and the, and the needs of the new technologies. And that's another area where the market is not going to be able to do a perfect yeah. job. You know, the infrastructure for education needs to come from the government, both in terms of financing, but I think even more so in terms of setting the direction which yeah. is, you know, what are the topics that we should put emphasis in? Many countries, actually, curriculum, the curriculum is very centralized and it's very backward looking. Mm -hmm. So that creates, I think, a lot of problems. But now I think the fourth one, the, the, the final part, the, yeah, uh, the, fi the final dimension and, 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 and also the second part of the answer to your question, I think is even more important. And I think that... To, to appreciate that, I want to make one other general comment and then I'll come back to, to this. Another sort of uh, presumption that we often make in economics is that uh, the level of capital, labor, investments, employment is generally efficient unless you know, there are government uh, taxes, distortions, mm -hmm. etc. that are introduced. And that's for, gen for, for, uh, 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 for most things that, that works fine. But I think, obviously, it's an idealization. It's an abstraction. And there are many different types of inefficiencies. And when it comes to automation, I think those issues become more important and therefore our uh, conceptual framework of, yeah, the market's going to get it right, becomes more strained. And what I mean by that is the following. So, imagine what you're doing is that you are making capital investments in buildings or in equipment that are going to work with labor. Then if there are labor market inefficiencies that make you not hire the right amount of labor, your additional physical investments are not going to make that much worse. In fact, they might even help you. Why? Well, because I wasn't hiring enough labor, now I hire more capital. Capital and labor are complements, so perhaps I'll hire a little bit more labor and that will help. So, in particular, there are two first-order inefficiencies that we've always known, but for that sort of reason, I think we didn't generally emphasize very much when thinking of this macro picture. One is that because of labor market inefficiencies, bargaining, efficiency wages, other things, wages are typically above opportunity cost. Mm. So at the margin, when you hire one more worker, you contribute to social surplus. You contribute to a uh, general increase in the better allocation of resources. Second, 
employed people are better citizens. So even ignoring the opportunity cost wage gap, when people are unemployed, they become uh, disillusioned, they don't play their civic role, uh, they, they don't take ownership of society, they become much much less devoted citizens for the general social community and then they start having negative effects on their families and their neighborhoods and so on and so forth. So again, if the labor market is functioning reasonably well, not that many people are employed uh, and, uh, and as a result <coughs> uh, this may not be the central thing. Now there's a question is it just employment or good employment? Perhaps you know, people, people are also disillusioned, not so happy, not good citizens, if they work at $8 an hour flipping burgers. So there's a question there whether. But, but clearly, I think the evidence, sociological evidence, is that when people have long-term stable jobs that are well-paying, that supports their families and enables them to sort of have a middle-class uh, living, yeah. I think that generally makes them better connected to society. So that's another, or what we, what we economists would call an external externality that firms wouldn't take that into account. Again, in the absence of automation, that's a consideration, but it's not a central consideration. Yeah, for sure. Let's. But now, answer, just, just to come, sorry. sorry. But now, come come to automation. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these problems become much worse. Why? Because now firms have a choice between whether to use machinery or labor. So. If the market incentives are such that they're going to, and then with the wave of new technologies, yeah. they're going to start using the machines, then this, you know, these inefficiencies that I pointed out start getting much worse. And this is where actually, this is the real answer to your question, which was very good, which is this is where the government needs to come. Yeah. So the government needs to create the ecosystem, the infrastructure, where the tendency of the market in the face of an automation technology wave of say, let's substitute more and more capital for labor is weakened. Because otherwise, we're not going to take advantage of this gap between uh, social opportunity cost and wage, and we're not going to be able to do a good job of serving the society by creating people who are happier and are attached to their jobs. And the way that the government can do that is several fold. First of all, the government can uh, uh, create an environment in which technologically firms are better placed to invest in new tasks, and more labor complementary innovations. And those are generally harder in some sense because automation can uh, proceed very fast, especially with today's technology. You may often need to come up with, dream up new ideas, new technologies, new products where, you know, this is sort of blue sky thinking where support of governments uh, for innovation process may be more important. But secondly, actually, when you look at our tax code and things like that in many countries, in US, but also in Europe, uh, you know, we, we subsidize capital, we tax yeah. labor. So there's again another natural tendency and, 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 and it's another area of institutional change that the government needs to sort of uh, play an active role in order to balance, in order to uh, level the playing field for capital and labor. So again, another aspect of the broader adjustment that needs to take place. Yes. Yeah. So there is uh, a big role for the government there. Um, let's compare a little bit the United States with Europe and Germany. Um, although the technological advance, <coughs> the definition of technological advance has been changed naturally over time, innovation and technology have always been a relevant factor for economic growth. So uh, economists and policymakers have targeted. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the European and German politics right now, for, but for almost a year now, one of the key topics of economic policy has been how to develop innovation and technology in Europe um, in a framework of industrial policymaking. Mm -hmm. So European policymakers see a big problem in the fact that Europe uh, has been able to develop innovation and technology as countries, for instance, the United States, States or, or Japan. And they also consider that without the creation of European uh, technology, they will lose uh, their competitiveness uh, in the future. So my question in this regard is, 
To what extent do you think European institutions haven't been able to create the right incentives you were talking about before to foster their own innovation market? Or maybe to compare it with the United States and, and other countries, what has been done there that worked good and here it hasn't worked? Well, I actually, uh, it's a good question. Actually, I think, <clears throat> and this is related to my answers to the previous question, I think both in the US and in Europe, things have been bad. Oh, okay. So, you know, one striking fact, again, starting with the US first, is that everybody's talking of this as the golden age of new technologies. Mm -hmm. But if you look at productivity statistics, they are very disappointing. The productivity growth has been slow for the last 25 years. So it's not as if all of those, you know, Silicon Valley uh, technologies that people tell us are the best thing that's ever happened, happened and it's going to solve all of our social problems. Well, we just don't see that. And, you know, we talk in the U.S. of, we just did, you know, you and I, uh, <coughs> labor not doing very well. Yeah. Well, lar a large, large part of that is lack of productivity growth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, this is actually a, another fact that unfortunately is, in my opinion, quite misunderstood. So it is true that if you look again the, in the U.S., things have gotten worse for labor. But that's mostly in manufacturing and mining. Okay. So two sectors that have become much less labor intensive with automation. But if you look at the whole of the economy, the reason why labor is doing badly is because productivity is doing badly. Yeah. So, so we're really not, there isn't much that U.S. can take pride in, in generating productivity. Yeah. And the same is true for Europe. So it is true, Europe does need to worry about it, but not the case that Europe should emulate the U.S. In fact, I think, and here we're now in the realm of speculation, yeah. I think some of the social and institutional changes that have happened in the U.S. are responsible for lack of productivity growth and <clears throat> some of the lack of adaptation along the lines of which we just talked about are, uh, are actually also related to the disappointing behavior of productivity growth. And in fact, the similarities between Europe and the US are quite interesting. So uh, two years ago, there was an OECD study that came out. Uh, <clears throat> and it showed a very interesting pattern that seems to be true across many industries and across many countries, which is that if you look at productivity growth by company and distinguish top companies, mm -hmm. say the top 10% in terms of productivity, their productivity growth is fairly f steady over the last 30 years. But if you look at the next layer of companies, say the middle in companies or 75th percentile companies, their productivity growth slows down pretty much everywhere. So why is that important? Well, it points out to three things. First, any explanation that says we are not generating productivity growth because it's just impossible to do it anymore, that's not going to be a very natural one because you see the good companies, you know, the Googles of this world Perfect. or Perfect. Amazons of this yeah. world, they're, they're growing fast. But it's obviously not the case that that technological change is as broadly based as before, because the next layer of companies isn't doing it. 
And the fact that this is happening, and that's the third point, suggests that there are problems in the ability of society to adapt and respond to these changes. Now, <clears throat> taking that into account, <clears throat> yes, I think it is very important to put the spotlight on innovation. And not just on innovation, but also on the adoption of new technologies yeah. and how they can be adopted best and deployed and what other adjustments can be made. Now, in that respect, there are two other observations I would like to make. One of them is actually Europe, in some ways, is not doing as badly. And that's an actually interesting phenomenon that, in my opinion, is slightly misunderstood. So there is a difference between Europe and the U.S., beyond all of the things that we're talking about. Europe is aging much faster. Yeah. So the demographic change is a big threat. But it's also an opportunity. And one of the ways in which it is an opportunity, and this is what is not always appreciated, is that it can act as a spur to adoption of technologies in order to replace workers that are now getting older. Okay. And now that's a very different type of replacement than what I was just talking about. Because previously what I was talking about is you're there, you're performing this job very nicely, and then I bring a robot and I replace you. Yeah. That's not great for you. But imagine that you're now too old and you can no longer do this job. Yeah. Then I bring a robot, that's not bad for you, it's actually good for everybody. Yeah. So induced automation, because the workforce doesn't have the capacity to perform the necessary tasks, is a much more of a win-win situation. Yeah. And that's actually what's happening in Europe. So who is the world leader in robots? Actually it's Germany. So Germany has the highest number of robots per production worker mm -hmm. in the world. And that's mostly because Germany is also the fastest aging country together with South Korea and Japan. Yeah, so the necessity is high. The necessity is high. But it's true, I mean, you know, France is not that far behind. Mm -hmm. Spain is actually a very fast rabbit robots adopter. Uh, Netherlands. So, so many European countries are making that adaptation. Now, mm -hmm. again, going back to what I just said, the market's going to move in the right direction, but not with the right amount. So, and in particular, what this doesn't guarantee, and this is where one, every country is deficient, uh, none of the European countries are doing enough for creating new tasks that is going to create jobs for the older workers, for yeah. example. Because, you know, if you're a 60-year-old, 65-year-old, you're not great on the factory floor working with big machinery, but you can do a lot of other yeah. things. So that's where we, so we still need more. Now, that's the first observation. The second observation now goes back to my earlier comment that I think the U.S. has suffered because of its social and political changes over the last 25 years. And I think one important element of that is that U.S. has been too concerned with shareholder value maximization and yeah. profit maximization and not enough for generating technological, organizational and, uh, and economic changes that would benefit all of the stakeholders, meaning mm -hmm. workers and, uh, 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 <clears throat> and the whole society. And, and I think Europe has had a, uh, also a wavering but still greater commitment to social democracy, yeah. social welfare state, uh, you know, uh, creating more of a shared prosperity. And, and I think in this new world, which some people see as bipolar, <laughs> China versus the U.S., States, yeah. I think, you know, there is room for a tripolar world where Europe plays a, a different tune, where the commitment to democracy, welfare states, uh, greater job creation for the whole population of higher quality jobs is greater. Now, Europe has not always been great at that. No. You know, uh, for a long time, people saw Europe as the 
uh, the country that could have generate jobs. But, but I think uh, now perhaps we all realize creating job growth, creating wage growth is really critical for the health yeah. of societies. If you don't want a uh, right-wing populist backlash and, uh, and, and, yeah. and, and an even more mortal threat to democracy, I think those are all very important things. So I think there is a possibility for uh, Europe to, to sort of play an important role there. Yeah. But is that going to be based on the same old industrial policy that Europe has pursued over the last three decades? I don't think so. So I think it has to be much more innovation-based. It has to have you know, institutional foundations for it, but probably not the same type of unions that have played a role in France or in Southern Europe, much more like the Scandinavian model, uh, which, again, is not a panacea and it's not a... Uh, uh, direct recipe for everybody, yeah, for sure. but, but the German or the Scandinavian model where uh, there's sort of a corporatist element where unions are not opposed to businesses, but there is some they sort compliment. of co complements or coordination and communication, uh, I think those are elements on which one can build on. And the role of the government, not just creating big companies, not creating you know Airbuses and so on, but creating the environment for these new tasks and, and labor complementary technologies. Yeah, but it's interesting what you said about this idea uh, that all countries want to achieve a Silicon Valley or have their own in their own countries. Mm -hmm. And you see it also in developing countries seeking to profit from mm -hmm. the transformation of their economies into a more or highly mm -hmm. digitalized. This regardless of the status of developing or emerging country. We see that in China, they want to be global leaders in artificial intelligence yes. in the following decade. Yes. Um, in your opinion, which impact will digitalization have on the development model of developing uh, and emerging countries? Do you think that uh, this would narrow down the gap between developed and developing countries? No, I think it's a challenge too. I mean, it is clear that every country needs to invest in digital technology because mm -hmm just that's the future. Yeah. And even if you're not a, uh, a Silicon Valley, you still need to have the engineers that are able to work with, improve, uh, 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 adjust these sort of technologies. So investing in digital, investing in uh, some degree artificial intelligence, I think it's a necessity for every country. But I think there is a sense in my opinion, that new technologies such as automation and artificial intelligence are much more targeted to the needs of developing developed world and much less to the developing yeah. world. You know, developing world again, China is a bit of an exception, is not aging. They are abundant in young, productive workers, if only you could educate them and put them into jobs. So Finding artificial intelligence and robots that will replace these workers is it obviously not the right thing. Yeah. So, in some sense, what I would say is that what the developing world needs, and this includes Indonesia, Malaysia, Latin America, Africa, is a second green revolution. And what distinguished the green revolution was that it was a critical innovation set of innovations for the developing world. And it was a set of innovations that the developing world itself did, and itself, it had to do it because the developed world wasn't doing it. It had no interest in uh, producing uh, hybrid seeds that would be used under the climatic conditions of the developing world. So the, the developing world itself had to do it. So I think we may need a similar compact moving into the future. Yeah. Um, well, now I, I, I don't know how much time we have because I think see. they were going to come and get me soon. But okay, then I ask you the last question I have. Uh, do you think that seeking? Um, do you think that the public opinion is critical enough about the role automation and digitalization takes in our day-to-day -day life? Are we critical enough about the consequences it has, positive and negative? No, we're not. I think. Uh, I think. The most important part is that artificial intelligence and automation and digital technology in general are a platform. Mm -hmm. And as such, we have a great 
deal of choice in how we develop it. And we can develop it for good or for bad. And the public opinion neither recognizes this nor very finely appreciates which are the good and which are the bad directions. And the reason for that is because experts are not helping. So if you look at the economics discussion on automation, mm -hmm. it's dominated by either complete uh, fear-mongering by people who are not experts or not even economists saying jobs are going to disappear, this is the end of work, or, or, or silly uh, sort of presumptions that, yeah, it's worked fine in the past, it will work fine now. If you look at the uh, problem of artificial intelligence and... Uh, uh, and, and, and in other things, again, it's a little bit, you know, I'm not an expert there, but it's a little bit the same. You know, it's either complete fear mongering, you know, we're going to create 1984 and the Big Brother, or it's all going to be wonderful. Yeah. But all of these are choices. You know, are we putting the right emphasis on using artificial intelligence for facial recognition versus other things? So those are all choices that we need to discuss and understand what their implications are. What are the social consequences of doing more facial recognition? What are the consequences of doing more of other things, mm -hmm. using them in education or healthcare? What are the consequences of using artificial intelligence more for automation versus more for job creation? I think those are the discussions yeah. we need to have. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much Thank for you. your time. Thank you, my pleasure, yeah. And uh, have a great day today. Congratulations again. Thank you.